Hello, 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 hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome to um, a Friday afternoon live, guys. Okay, so guys, welcome to whoever happens to be in the TikTok study talk space. Um, and you happen to see that I'm going live. Okay, so welcome, guys. Um, these lives are super impromptu. Um, and so I'll just pop up on vibes um, or when I have some time, guys, okay? So, guys, welcome. Um, I am aiming, I always say, oh, um, I need to be off at six and then I'm not off at six, but today I'm actually going to pop off or um, not pop off, uh, disappear at 6 p.m., guys, okay? Anyway, I'm here to do um, an English language paper two live, um, partly because I remember um, seeing some messages after the live that I did last week um, and it said that I'd glitched out at some stage, um, which is a shame, uh, because I went odd in that live. Um, but also guys, I wanted to mention actually that, um, obviously I keep on mentioning that I have, um, a language paper two masterclass every Sunday, which still go ahead. Okay. From five to 6 PM this Sunday, I'm going to be going over how to answer and how to write a full mark response for question number five for this paper two exam. Okay. So this is a locked paper that I'm going to be going over this Sunday from five to 6 PM. It's going to be my final masterclass before the Christmas break. However, guys, um, what I do also want to mention as part of this live is, um, I'm currently actually doing a Black Friday kind of, um, little deal thing, which, um, for example, there's a bunch of flashcards that are created. Um, I tend to create a lot of study material for my students, which a lot of my students find super useful. So I created like flashcards and mind maps for like Macbeth, Inspector Calls, Christmas Carol, and so on. And usually these go for like, uh, I want to say $5.99, but currently I'm doing like a Black Friday um, flash sale for like a quid. You can get a bunch of flashcards. So for those of you, especially that are doing literature paper one and paper two mocks, um, not only have I got the flashcards on sale, but also I do know that a bunch of people also keep on messaging me um, either on TikTok or in emails talking about literature week. When are you going to do literature week? When are you going to go over and do Macbeth class? I missed your inspector calls literature week in half terms. So what I did is I bundled them all together. For those of you that may have missed those literature classes and literally you can get all seven classes. So this is like Power and Conflict, Poetry, Unseen Poetry, Macbeth, Inspector Calls, Christmas Carol, Jekyll and Hyde and so on. You can get all of those. Literally each class was like a tenner. You can get those for like 50 quid. Okay. So um, that's part of the Black Friday deal. And so you're going to be valid for this week and then completely getting taken off. Um, and the literature week, by the way, guys, for those of you that are keen on joining any other live literature weeks, I'm going to be putting a literature week um, events page up fairly soon. Um, just to let you guys know my next literature week going over Macbeth, Christmas Carol, Jekyll and Hyde, Love and Relationships Poems, Power and Conflict. What's the other one? Um, there's a few other ones. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, I'm probably going to do. And there's another one somewhere there. I want to say Power and Conflict or Unseen Poetry. Anyway, I'm going to actually do a literature week um, in Feb, Feb uh, half term. Okay, so I'm going to pop up the page because people always find it helpful to kind of know when I do these literature weeks. Um, so this is for those of you who maybe you've actually already done your mocks, right? So um, I do know quite a number of students have already done literature paper one, literature paper two mocks. They maybe did pretty badly or got like fairly low marks. For example, maybe you did quite badly on Macbeth or maybe perhaps your unseen poetry needs a bit of work or maybe for instance it was power and conflict that, that let you down or inspector calls whatever it is for those of you who are like actually um I feel like I really need to buckle down I'm not gonna make it I've got my GCSEs in 2025 already gotten my mock results back and I'm seeing threes and fours um for those of you that are kind of scared that you're not gonna make it just advance um notice I am gonna be doing another one-off literature week it's not gonna be on TikTok these are gonna be literature um private literature events but I'll be putting it up on the website okay so um as I said guys I'm going to be doing a GCSE language paper 2 masterclass this Sunday from 5 p.m to 6 p.m going over how to write a full mark response for question number five of this 2024 paper guys these papers are locked I am not allowed I AQA is literally gonna be on my back they were um last year when I talked about the 2023 paper um, I'm not trying to catch a case guys. So obviously I'm not going to be sharing this on a public platform, but, for, but obviously for those of you guys who want to see how to answer this, I'm going to be going over this, uh, this Sunday. Okay. And by the way, guys, I'm going to be talking about language paper two and question five, 
um, and how to approach this question. And also, guys, especially for those of you that still have some language um, exams upcoming, maybe you've got your mocks on this paper this month in, the, in December, or maybe you have your January mocks, right? And you're going to be doing language paper two. I would like to suggest, guys, to begin um, to familiarize yourself with this paper if you've not already done so, right? Remember, with language paper two, you always have one hour, 45 minutes, which is the same amount of time as language paper one. What makes it quite challenging is you have to read two inserts. One is a modern text and the other is a Victorian source, right? And what is challenging about this is because you've got exactly the same amount of time when it comes to reading, when it comes to answering the five questions, when it comes to also answering question five, whether you've got to write a letter, article or speech, you still need to write in a way that's really engaging, really creative. OK, and that's precisely what I'm going to be talking about today. OK, not in connection to this paper. OK, so obviously for those of you that are keen to know how to answer this paper, on Sunday um, at 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., I'm going to be having a masterclass. I've literally put the link in the bio for those of you that are interested in joining in and going over how to write a model response for this question. If you haven't done your mocks for language paper two, this is probably going to be the paper that comes up. However, I am still going to talk about question number five, okay? But question number five in relation to this 2018 paper. More so for those of you who just want to understand the skill set that you need to develop when it comes to question five, the reason why I keep on emphasizing question five, both for paper one and paper two, by the way, is because this is worth half of the paper's overall marks, okay? So remember that of this one hour, 45 minutes, you need to be allocating at least 45 to 50 minutes. I would recommend 50 minutes for question number five because it literally determines massively the marks you get in this paper. So of course, I'm going to talk about timings. And guys, as I said, I tend to waffle. Um, I am an English teacher after all. So waffling is part of the profession. That is one of the things that attracts English teachers, right? We like to waffle, but I'm going to try not to waffle because I need to finish at 6pm. Let's talk about timings, how to manage um, all five questions. And of course, the insert reading, right? So remember, guys, in terms of exam strategy, exam technique, right? And for those of you, for example, who have got your language paper two upcoming, this is how you should manage your time. Obviously, for those of you that maybe have already done paper two and it wasn't looking that great, you're getting some really, really dismal marks. That means probably you're mismanaging your timings. You're not allocating the time that the big mark questions deserve, right? So remember that you should always spend the first 10 minutes of this exam reading the questions first and then the two inserts. What that means, guys, is one of the key skills, if you're in year 11 and you're doing your GCSEs next year in 2025, you need to start working on that speed reading and speed writing, okay? It, it, that's just, it, it is what it is, right? You've got about 10 minutes. If you start spending 20, 30 minutes reading the insert, reading again, for example, guys, I was going over the, these two inserts with my masterclass, right? I was saying, guys, number one, when it comes to reading the inserts, you need to just work on your speed reading and speed writing, especially if you don't have the um, extra time allocated for this paper, okay? So say, for example, you literally have only the one hour, 45 minutes, you have got to get that reading speed up. And remember, this is something that's fairly controversial, but I strongly believe when you are answering English and using any of the inserts, you literally will probably use just 20% of the overall paper, right? So um, in terms of quotations, what that means, guys, is do not waste your time. And this is, again, going back to why I say you want to spend a max of 10 minutes on reading both inserts, because you're not going to use 100% of the inserts. You're not going to write 100% of the quotations. You're probably, if anything, going to write and use between 10 to 20% of the quotations. What that means, right? So this is why I say you don't want to spend too much time reading, rereading, rereading oh I really need to understand exactly what the person said in source a oh I really need to know what this Victorian author said you don't need to right because you're only using 20% what you need to understand is about 20% of the extract so if you understand like say three paragraphs that's great because you're then just going to use them for your answers okay um so when it comes to your reading number one the best way to improve your reading speed is obviously practicing reading more because you get faster but also number two do not stress about understanding 100% of source A and 100% of source B because you're not going to use 100% of the quotations anyway. Make sure you just focus on the paragraphs you understand. And if you're also clever in your strategy when approaching this question, if you already read the questions 
at the start before reading the inserts you already know what you're looking for right so if you know what you're looking for in questions one to four then you're reading the inserts and you focus and really zoom in on just a few paragraphs then you've got more than you need and more than enough to answer the questions okay anyway Question number one, which is a multiple choice question, right? You always ask to select four statements that are true. You want to spend a max of five minutes on this question. It's worth four marks. Ideally, uh, the closer you get into your GCSEs, you actually want to take this time. I would say actually five minutes is excessive. This is something, again, I keep on emphasizing to my masterclass students. Yes, we're still in early days. Yes, we're just about to go into Christmas. So we're going to have, you know, a bit of time over Christmas break. This is for year 11s to practice and get our reading speed up. However, when answering questions, I would actually say, guys, when we get closer to GCSE season, especially GCSE season definitely starts from January, you want to get this time down. I find this time really excessive for a four mark question because you want to allocate that extra time that you save here to the big mark questions. For question two, which is the first comparison, it's a summary between uh, differences or similarities between the two sources. It's worth eight marks to spend a max of 10 minutes on this question. Question three, which is the language question you look at one source how does the writer use language this question is worth 12 marks to spend roughly around 30 minutes on this question question four which is the big comparison question this goes back to why i say question one work on that speed if you take this down to like 60 seconds selecting the facts that are true then you can try and take this up to about 20 minutes but say you spend five minutes on this question that means you're left with around 17 minutes for this question, which is a chunky comparison question. You've got to talk about writers' methods. You have to evaluate. You have to talk about writers' viewpoints and perspectives in both sources. There's a lot to do. You're spinning lots of plates. Question five is what I'm going to be talking about today. And hopefully this live will not glitch out because as I said, I do um, understand that last week's live, I think I glitched out at some stage. Anyway, so hopefully today's live will not glitch out and you will get a nice smooth transition across, um, you know, the model answer that I work through. Guys, I would like to recommend spending about 50 minutes on this question. This question is worth 50% of the marks, right? Say, for example, you literally ran out of time and at least you answered question number five, you have secured 50% of the marks, okay? Say if you literally get four marks, you've already probably gotten, if not a low level four, a level five, right? So you've literally actually passed. That's why it's really important with question five to give it the time it deserves. Now, of course, that should be subdivided into 10 minutes planning, which is sacred, and then 40 minutes writing, and now I'm going to turn my attention to question number five. Again, guys, for those of you that are looking at this and you're like, oh my gosh, you're moving too quickly through this. Wait, wait, wait. How about section eight? Blah, blah, blah. Guys, I go over this in more detail when I cover paper two. Okay, so literally every Sunday, well, this Sunday is going to be the final masterclass before Christmas, but I'm going to be answering question five for this paper. And this is for people who have any questions. Maybe you want to see how I wrote model answers for question one to four. I type them all up because I also know people don't um, understand my handwriting. Okay, so of course, for those of you that kind of need a little bit more, maybe you've gotten your mock results, right? So maybe you've already done your paper two. You've gotten your mock results and you're like, what the hell is this? I am not going to make it unless I literally, you know, um, plug in unless I really, really pull my socks up. Right. So for those of you, of course, who are like, I really flopped myself. I didn't do as well as I thought. My teachers are telling me that I'm basically working at a grade three, grade four level for language paper two. Of course, guys, join in. Ask me all the questions you want. Because again, as I said, guys, with TikTok, I literally pop up, do my thing, and then I'm out. And also, guys, for those of you that are just looking for flashcards and stuff for literature paper one, paper two, as I said, guys, I did a, um, a literature week masterclasses for the 2024 papers, looking at Macbeth, Christmas Carol, all those. And basically for this, this week I'm having like a little Black Friday deal where you can get all the classes. Um, I think each class was uh, 10 quid, right? And so that would be 70 quid, right? But literally doing a discount for all classes, you can get them for 50 quid, okay? So I think when you go on the website, that's going to be one of the pop-ups. You can literally see all the deals there. I think the flashcards, which I've spent ages putting together, those are going for like one pound, okay? This is for those of you that just want to get that literature knowledge up, okay? If you want um, that information or to see, you know, what are the deals there, literally just click the bio in 
the link. So guys, as I said, I'm going to be turning my attention to question five of this paper. Once more, guys, I'm going to be answering the 2024 question on Sunday at 5 p.m. in my masterclass. Guys, remember that with question number five, you want to spend about 50 minutes. You are always given a topical issue. In this case, this is a 2018 paper. You are told, um, and this is an issue that tends to come up every so often when it comes to like things like public transport, pollution, climate change, that type of thing. The statement says, cars are noisy, dirty, smelly, and downright dangerous. Okay, so there's a very clear perspective in this statement. Cars are terrible. They should be banned from all towns and city centers, allowing people to walk and cycle in peace. Write a letter. So last week, guys, I did an article. Today, I'm looking at a letter to the Minister for Transport, arguing your point of view on this statement, okay? So for this kind of question, and by the way, guys, actually, um, I think... For those of you who might be um, interested in seeing uh, what this kind of model response looks like, I also send out emails every so often with like free model answers. OK, so also for those of you guys that download something on the website, I always tend to add you to the email list and you get like some of these freebies. And I think this potentially I might be sending this out as a freebie to my email subscribers. OK, so for those of you that maybe want to see a, a typed up response, I'm probably going to be sending this out maybe next week or the week after. I'll see guys. OK. Anyway, so this is the statement. Cars are noisy, dirty, danger, a, a, a noisy, dirty, smelly, and downright dangerous. That's the first part of the statement. Then it says they should be banned from all towns and city centers, allowing people to walk and cycle in peace. What this is basically telling me is cars are bad. They should be banned and people should be able to walk and cycle in peace. Do I agree? Do I disagree? And I need to write a letter. With these types of statements for question number five, this especially goes out to the people that do humanities topics like RE, history, where when you're making a discussion, you need to write to what extent in the same paragraph, you're also disagreeing with that. What I tend to find, guys, because this is obviously an English debate, an English GCSE essay, not a history or RS essay, the questions that do well and the answers and the responses that do well are those that have a very clear perspective and then very clear counter argument. Guys, I would like to recommend the following. When you're given any topical issue, instead of taking an RE or history approach where you agree to an extent and disagree to an extent where you have the same argument and then counter arguments within the same paragraph, don't do that. Decide I'm going to take a black and white approach. I'm either going to completely agree with both parts of the statements or completely disagree because what then happens is I can show off my debating skills by presenting counter arguments. OK, so that's the first thing. Take a polarized view. What I mean by that is either agree completely or disagree with this statement because what that therefore means is you set out a clear line of argument why you either agree or disagree but then also remember that a debate needs to show that you've considered the counterpoints the counter arguments then you include counter responses and counter arguments you're showing that you're weighing both sides of the argument the issue that um, students face, especially students that do things like RE, history that teach you, okay, you've been given a source, for example, in history, make sure in the same paragraph, you both agree and disagree. What tends to happen with your English GCSE examiner when you take that approach is sometimes what comes off to them is your answer seems to be contradictory, right? I know it's kind of confusing because why is it being rewarded in one GCSE, like history, where I talk about yes and no in the same paragraph, but yet it's coming off as a weakness in English GCSE. It's because this is not a history essay, it's an English GCSE essay, and all your examiners want to see is you are firstly engaging with the point of view that you've been given, the statement that you've been given, but also number two, you are showing debate skills so you show one side of the argument why people would agree with you and then another side of the argument why people would disagree with you and then the other aspect that comes up in your English GCSE essay that you don't need to demonstrate to the same extent as say an RE essay or history essay is things like 
rhetorical questions, alliteration, one word sentences, things that bring your writing to life. Okay. So guys, I would like to suggest when you're answering question five of paper two, do not take an RE or history approach where you agree and disagree in the same paragraph because you're going to come across as contradictory. You are not writing a history essay. Remember that this is an English GCSE essay. So I would suggest decide which perspective you're going to take. In this case, I'm going to disagree. Yeah. So I'm going to say no. By the way, guys, you don't get extra points for agreeing or disagreeing. The points rack up as you develop your argument and you use things like anecdotes, examples and made up statistics to support your argument and to strengthen your argument. OK, so whether you agree, right, because some people say, oh, um, do I get more marks if I agree with a statement? No. Do I get more marks if I disagree with the statement? No. The marks reside in, number one, you engaging and answering the question and doing what the question asks you to do, right? But also the marks come in when you are showing and using persuasive techniques like anecdotes, example statistics, but also the marks come in when you're using techniques that bring your writing, your speech, your letter, your article to life, things like rhetorical questions, things like alliteration, one word sentences, the same things actually, and this is interesting, the same techniques that you demonstrate in your creative writing question five. Actually, if you look and review the mark scheme, again, I always review mark schemes with my students in my master classes. And one of the things that I'll be going over when I talk about question number five in my Sunday GCSE masterclass, when I send over and I show this mark scheme to my students is the AO5 and AO6 skills that examiners are looking for and the points that they raise when it comes to question number five in paper two are literally exactly the same points raised for creative writing. What that means is when you're writing your question number five for paper two, you still need to be creative. You still need to be engaging, right? Because remember guys, also, this is another aspect when it comes to presenting your letter, article or speech. You not only need to um, fulfill the primary purpose of your nonfiction writing, which is to inform your reader, inform your audience, but you equally need to fulfill what is called the secondary purpose. That is to entertain your reader. The entertainment factor is now where you find the overlap between the same skill set, rhetorical questions, alliteration, similes, um, sibilance, all of that stuff, listing, tricolon, all the stuff that you use anyway in, que uh, in question five for paper one, this comes in in question number five for paper two. Again, guys, I'm going to go over this in more detail when it comes to the locked 2024 paper on Sunday with my private masterclass. OK, so obviously, for those of you guys that are keen to see all five questions answered grade nine level. So these are full mark responses that I do with my class on Sunday. And obviously, my class literally can ask me whatever questions they want to ask me, okay? We tend to like overrun always by like 30 minutes because there's so many questions that come up. Obviously, if you're keen on that, if you're looking at this live and you're like, okay, this is kind of helpful, but I need a little bit more, just join in on that. And then obviously ask me all the questions you want to ask on Sunday. So because I've disagreed with this statement and I need to show a polarized perspective, okay? So I'm going to have my no arguments on the one hand, but of course I also need to consider counter arguments. Why would people disagree with my perspective? This is still a debate. Therefore, I need to show these debating skills, okay? So when I'm thinking about my main points for my perspective, and of course also counterpoints why people will disagree with me, I also need to consider making up some anecdotes, examples, and statistics. Why would I first disagree? Well, firstly, definitely when it comes to this statement, right? Especially the first half, cars are noisy, dirty, smelly. That's a mistake that I would disagree with. That's um, false to say because there are many environmentally friendly cars that do not prevent and they do not prohibit people from walking and cycling in peace, okay? So that don't prohibit, prohibit. By the way, I'm using ambitious language and vocabulary. It goes without saying, this is an English GCSE, so I need to use ambitious language, okay? So don't prohibit people 
from walking or cycling. And here, I am going to give some examples to support my answer and my perspective of cars that are not noisy, dirty, smelly, or downright dangerous. And these cars do not have an effect on people's ability to walk and cycle in peace, right? Um, these cars could be, for example, Teslas, electric cars, like, you know, the electric BMWs, um, you know, uh, Uber uses the Toyota Priuses, which are supposed to be uh, environmentally friendly and so on and so forth, right? That's going to be my first reason why I disagree completely, black and white. Second reason is that actually cars are very safe, arguably even safer than cycling around everywhere and anywhere, okay? In fact, they've actually saved the lives of people, right? So many cars are safe, and they have saved people's lives. And I'm actually going to give an example of um, Sally Smith's grandmom. So I'm going to use this anecdote. Sally Smith's grandmom, who had, so grandmother, who had a stroke, and she used her car to rush her to a and &E. right? So I'm going to use that as an example. Actually, if anything, if Sally Smith had just bicycles and if her car was banned, her grandmother might have, you know, God forbid, lost her life, okay? So that's going to be another um, reason why I disagree, black and white. Also, I'm going to make the argument that actually road standards are so high. We've got things like ultra low emission zone. We have things like, you know, carbon CO2 emissions, like stuff like that, which is um, preventing cars which are noisy, dirty, smelly from being on the roads, right? And here I'm going to use a made up statistics. So road standards are really high. And my made up statistic is, I'm going to say, according to Cambridge University, this is totally made up. You don't have to actually use real life statistics. I'm going to say that Cambridge University found that actually in the UK, 80% of cars have close to zero CO2, yeah, carbon emissions. Now I need to consider counter arguments. Why would people disagree with me? And I need to first remember that um, maybe potentially somebody who'd actually think that, yeah, cars are noisy, dangerous, blah, blah, blah. They should be banned, allowing people to walk and cycle in peace. Actually, um, one of the things that um, cars can do, so I'm going to use the um, example of how cars may be um, in places like America. Um, you know, cars have changed the infrastructure of a city um, and many people have been discouraged from cycling, right? There's no like cycle lanes, okay? So cars in some cities have led to a reduction in cycling lanes, meaning that a bunch of people don't actually have the ability to walk and cycle in peace. And I'm going to use a counter anecdote. I'm going to talk about John Doe, who lives in South London, and he was almost knocked over um, because actually um, there's no cycling lanes, right? So that's an example of how cars can be downright dangerous and people are not able to walk and cycle in peace. The second counter argument would be actually, you know, the most... Fatal accidents are not by ships, not by plane, not by anything except cars, right? So I'm going to here have another um, counter statistic, right? It's another made up statistic that um, gov.uk found, um, you know, car crashes, um, uh, let's say um, people are 60% more likely to die, so more likely to die from car crashes than plane crashes than planes, okay? That's my discussion. And of course, I also need to show an awareness of form because this is a letter, meaning I need to start off by having a, a made up um, address for the person that's receiving this, which is the Minister for Transport. I also need to obviously make up a name of this Minister for Transport. I'm going to call him John Smith. Um, 
MP John Smith, right? Because he's a minister. I also need to add a date, right? Showing that this is a letter I'm going to make up to, uh, I'm going to have today's date or just some date um, in this week. I also need to have a dear, whoever I'm talking to, then my opening paragraphs, my main body points, right? This side of the argument, then my counter arguments before I finish off with kind regards, yours sincerely, my name and surname. Okay, so this is my model response, my model answer for my letter. And guys, remember that a common mistake that year 11s make when they see a question like this, they're like, oh, it's a letter. Okay, so I'm just going to say, hi, Minister for Transport. In this letter, I will. In this letter, I think. In this letter, in this letter, in this letter. Meaning, even if they may be perhaps fulfilling the primary purpose, they're definitely falling down and falling short of the secondary purpose. Meaning that they are losing marks when it comes to these 24 marks for their content and organisation. Remember, guys, that... You need to, even if it's a letter, article or speech, do not start with things like in this article, in this letter, um, and then just writing, making it just a glorified essay. You still need to make it engaging, entertaining, and also show an awareness of form, okay? So because it's a letter, I'm going to start off with my made up address, okay? So I'm going to say that this minister, so I'm going to call him MP. Um, I'm going to say Wesley Smith. By the way, he's an MP, right? I'm not going to say Mr. Wesley Smith because he's a member of parliament. He's a minister. Then I'm going to make up his address. I'm going to say one London way. And then I'm going to say Westminster, London. And I'm going to make up a postcode. Postcode is letter, letter, number, number, letter, letter, right? So S W one one K B. That's step number one for my letter done. Step number two. I am going to put the date, right? So I'm going to say that it is the 22nd of November 2024. Then I'm going to address my recipient, okay? So dear Minister, it could be Miss Minister Wesley Smith, Minister Smith, okay? Obviously, gold points and gold stars for those of you that probably know our Minister for Transport, okay? This is actually low-key embarrassing that I don't know who our Minister of Transport is, okay? Low-key, low-key. Anyway, so I have shown a clear awareness of form, right? So I have started with my made-up address to the person that's receiving this letter. I've also added the date when I wrote this letter in this year. Then I have written to my address C, right? So I've shown a real clear awareness that this is a letter. It is unmistakable to my examiner. They're like, okay, great. She knows how to lay out a letter. Now I need to start off with my opening paragraph before I launch into these main points. I need to introduce my perspective on this statement. Do I agree? Do I disagree? And I will take a polarized perspective. A good way to start either a letter, article or speech. Remember, guys, that this is not supposed to be a glorified essay. This is supposed to be a really engaging essay. You're supposed to entertain your reader whilst also informing them, okay? That therefore means I don't start with saying, I'm writing this letter to disagree with your statement. I'm writing this letter to, no, because that's really boring. How I'm going to start it is presenting the opposing view before creating some friction and then showing my perspective, okay? There are a plethora several, um, a plethora of people, alliteration. So I'm already getting in those uh, marks for making my writing engaging, using creative techniques, using creative devices. I'm using alliteration. So there are a plethora of people who believe cars are the work of the devil. So I am using hyperbole. They think that, more alliteration, cars are noisy. Um, they see cars as dirty, dangerous, or dirty, smelly, and dangerous. In their eyes, cars should be banned, should be banned in favour of people cycling and walking. 
So this is the counter view. Yet now I'm going to create some friction to show that I disagree. Yet I disagree. Short sentence to change the pace of my writing. Cars are essential. They save lives. They do not get in the way of pedestrians. I'm talking about the second half of the statement and cyclists. It would be a catastrophe, catastrophe if you banned them. And I'm using the pronoun you to include my minister, okay? Because I'm obviously writing to the minister of transport who is in charge of banning these cars, right? So made my perspective really clear. I've, in my opening paragraph, I've addressed the question. It's also really clear to my reader exactly which perspective I'm taking, right? I'm going to disagree completely with the statement. Now I'm going to start off with why cars actually shouldn't be banned. They're environmentally friendly and they don't actually prohibit people from walking. Um, the idea that cars are dirty or smelly is ridiculous. So now I'm using overdramatic language, right? I'm dramatizing my language. Cars um, used to be dangerous, yet it is an outdated belief that they pollute. They pollute. What about all of our electric vehicles? Now here I have asked a rhetorical question. What about all of our electric vehicles? They are amazing innovations that do not prohibit hibit people that want to walk and cycle in peace. Now here I'm going to ask my minister to think of different scenarios, right? So think of Tesla's, Toyota, Priuses, and electric BMWs. I've listed, used rule of three to show these examples. Um, should they be banned? I think not. That's it with my first argument, okay? So I've started by saying that actually, contrary to this idea of them being dirty, noisy, smelly, but also engaging with the second half of the statement, actually, it's wrong to um, agree with this statement. Now I'm going to go into the idea that cars can actually be the opposite of dangerous. They're actually quite safe and they've actually saved many lives, okay? So um, it is preposterous. Again, I'm using hyperbole. I'm using over-exaggerated language, right? Again, this makes the letter engaging, okay? So it's preposterous to um, state that cars are dangerous. It is um, cars protect the vulnerable. Think of all the women who work late um, or even who work jobs that finish late like fast food restaurants which close after 
midnight. Cars are a lifeline to them. Equally, Sally Smith, who is 19 years old, recently, so now I'm going to my anecdote, recently experienced um, the life-saving effects, the life-saving impact of owning a car. Now, here I'm going to go into why it's not dangerous. It's the opposite. It can be, it can save lives, right? Um, her grandmother had a stroke. They lived far away from a hospital. She um, put her grandmother in her car and rushed her to A and E. This think of what would have happened if you had banned her car. It is even frightening to imagine. Okay, so here I have added the second reason as to why I disagree using a really compelling anecdote, right? So an anecdote, why anecdotes are so powerful is they really um, enable and help your reader to really imagine one person that's been really affected by the issue. Now I'm going to go into my third reason. Why cars are actually not noisy, dirty, smelly, downright dangerous. And actually they shouldn't be banned. You know, um, they don't release any CO2 and most cars actually are quite clean, right? And once more, there's lots of lanes, lots of um, roads that enable people to um, cycle and walk in peace. Um, it is a grave mistake to see cars as problems. In fact, you are well aware of how high our road standards are in the UK. Um, uh, rules like ultra low emissions mean that cars do not even mean that most cars do not really pollute there are several several cycling and pedestrian lanes so people are not um, obstructed by cars in fact, indeed, Cambridge University, so totally made up, Cambridge University, made up statistic, found that 80% of cars in the UK emit close to zero uh, CO2. So here I have added my three reasons for my perspective. But now in my letter, I need to also include counter arguments, okay, before finishing off by urging my Minister for Transport to see my perspective, not to ban them and not to agree with this statement. So now here, I'm going to go into my first counter argument, how naysayers, people who disagree with me, that's a really good word to use, ambitious word, naysayers, 
would argue that actually cars in some cities have, um, you know, led to reduction in cycle lanes. And I'm going to use John Doe, who is uh, our cyclist in South London, who um, actually was almost knocked over by a car, right? Yet, naysayers would argue that there are still too many cities that prioritize roads and highways for cars at the expense of cyclists and pedestrians. America or even USA is a country well known for being hostile, mean, cruel to walkers and cyclists and cyclists. Everyone walks there or even everyone drives there. Yet UK is also guilty of this. Indeed, second anecdote, John Doe, who lives in South London, was almost knocked down, so was almost knocked down by a car whilst cycling, whilst he was, he was cycling to work. This is because he had to share the same dangerous roads, the same dangerous roads as cars. That's my first counter argument equally. So now this is my second counter argument. It is still well known that many fatal accidents, this is where people die, are caused by cars. In fact, gov.uk, so this is my made up statistic, found that and let me check my plan. What was my made up statistic? 60% of people, people are 60% more likely. People are 60% more likely to die from car crashes, car crashes than planes, trains, or ships. What does this tell us? Rhetorical question. Answer, cars must be banned. Um, pedestrians and cyclists still are in grave danger, are in grave danger. Those are my two counter arguments done. So I've had my perspective as well as counter arguments now, even if I've shown that I have balanced my discussion by showing two opposing view with my made up anecdotes, my made up statistics, I'm still going to finish off my concluding paragraph by saying, even if I've considered why people will disagree with me, even if I've considered, you know, why cars could potentially be downright dangerous, all of these things, and people are not walking and cycling in peace, I still think my perspective is right. So this is how to close. Do not use words like in conclusion. That being said, it would be a mistake to ban cars. 
cause save lives. Cars are now clean and pollution free. We have numerous parks where people can walk, can walk, and lanes where people can cycle. I urge you, so now here I'm talking directly to the Minister of Transport. I urge you, as the Minister for Transport, to protect our cars. Then, because this is a letter, I need to finish off by closing um, and showing an awareness of form, right? So here I can say yours sincerely, or if I'm really scared about getting the spelling wrong, a really good closing to show that this is a letter is something as simple as kind regards. It's really easy spelling and um, it's a nice way to finish, okay? So kind regards, and because it is a formal letter, I will do my name, Barbara, and my surname, Njao. And that's it. Done for this letter, okay? So guys, um, in terms of paper two, as I said, for those of you that potentially have done your mocks, maybe struggled, perhaps maybe you have your paper two upcoming mocks, I will definitely say, say for example, you're in a position where you're like, I don't know what I should focus on. I don't know whether I should, um, you know, spend my time practicing for section A or section B. Um, I'm really bad with my timings, guys. Remember that your question number five, especially for question for paper two, you need to invest a lot of time into getting that right. Okay. Make sure that it's engaging. Make sure that it's um, easy for your teacher to award you marks. So you want to show not only that you have debated the discussion, but also you've used persuasive language, right? You've used rhetorical questions, alliteration, all of that stuff, and also added persuasive techniques like anecdotes, examples, and statistics. And guys, as I said, on Sunday, I'm going to be going over the uh, 2024 paper, okay? So of course, today I've gone over the 2018 paper, but for those of you that maybe want to see a model response for all five questions on Sunday, I'm going to be going over specifically how to answer question number five for this paper, Obviously, you can join me in my masterclass where you can ask any questions. And as I said, guys, I'm currently doing like a Black Friday sale just for this week where for those of you that maybe want to do some literature practice, maybe perhaps you want to lock in this Christmas, you're thinking, do you know what? I really need to um, lock in with literature paper one with my Macbeth Christmas Carol or paper two in spectacles, all of that. For those of you that may have missed my literature week back in October where I went over the 2024 papers, I literally have like a special deal running on getting um, the bundle and the pack of literally all the model responses for the questions. So this is Macbeth, Inspector Calls, Christmas Carol, Unseen Poetry, Pound Conflicts and so on, literally at a discount. Okay, so each le lesson and I think each class was like a tenner. So that was seven classes, which would be 70 quid. But for those of you that are keen on getting the bundle, which is only going to be available to get and download this week, it'll be 50 quid. OK, so obviously, for those of you guys who are keen or curious to see what's on offer, literally just click the link. OK, and of course, also, if you want to join in the masterclass, it's also in the link. OK, anyway, guys, thank you so much for joining in. As I said, uh, hopefully I finish on time. OK, um, I'm going to jet. And um, I hope you guys find this helpful. I hope also this didn't lag out. I'll see, obviously, based on the comments that I get afterwards. Um, and thanks, guys, for joining in, okay? And obviously, for those of you that are still in the thick of it with your mocks, best of luck for your mocks. Make sure you keep up with the energy, the enthusiasm. And as I said, guys, make sure you just keep that practice up. Obviously, for the guys who have got your mocks in January, make sure you're using your Christmas break to lock in, okay? Anyway, guys, uh, thank you so much for joining in. I will be heading off now. And um, for those of you that are going to be uh, joining in my masterclass, I shall see you guys on Sunday. Make sure you obviously get your questions ready. And um, have a good evening, guys. Okay, so take care, guys. Love you all. Bye-bye.